you could look into ancient history and realize that the migrations and the movements and the conquests of peoples in very ancient times affect the conditions in which we live in today. What if you could have an insight into these various happenings from diverse areas as Central Africa to the middle of the Levant to the various steps around Europe and Asia? Peter Nemitz offers a very unique insight with a penetrating clarity we cover such topics as the Bantu expansion, as the development of Roman civilization, then later European man, and also other various contemporary topics of contention. Join us for a wild exploration into the farthest reaches of what we know as civilization itself. Adjusting this. <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay. All good. How are you? Peter Nemitz, my friend. How are you doing? Good. How about yourself? I'm pretty good. Um, there's, uh, I always, I, I do an intro I record separately because it's kind of like, kind of awkward to like pretend that there's an audience. But, um, you know. Um, yeah, of course. So uh, there's many, uh, I, I know we didn't, uh, I didn't give you a heads up, but I just, I think uh, I've been binging a lot of your spaces and your uh, streams um, with uh, Scott Greer and with um, Patrick Casey. And I wanted to sort of uh, talk to you because I, I truly think that you are one of uh, one of the more int most interesting sort of um, thinkers currently and the sort of depth of your knowledge, particularly on the sort of uh, genetics and the genealogy of different peoples. I wanted to sort of... Uh, talk to you about some of your more um well it's maybe controversial opinions or uh but also i guess um you're changing views on the current uh situation in the well for youtube opsec purposes the blue and yellow country but also i think your sort of unique critique of the c contemporary what i call the e-right or the dissident right or the new right whatever you want to call it and also the, i guess the direction of america uh, so I guess just je really start off really briefly. Um, how did you get into the sort of fields of research that you got your, you're into and, uh, well, of course, without doxing yourself. And also I would want to talk to you about your book as well, that you, or your translation. So, uh, yeah, just, just maybe a general introduction of your sort of broad fields of knowledge and so forth. Sure. Um, I mean, you know, professionally, academically, I've never studied any of this stuff formally. Um, you know, I work in water management. It's my profession, um, you know, which, of course, has nothing to do with politics. It's very, uh, a very political field. Um, you know, the reason I went into this was because it is an apolitical field. It's very, very, uh, you know, I assume I'll get docked someday. Um, <laughs> you know, it's not a field you can really get fired for for politics. Yeah. That's why I went into it. Um, you know, all this other stuff, I mean, much more of my passion, you know, ancient history. Um, you know, when I, way back, like my earliest memories, when I was like, you know, in kindergarten, first grade, uh, I was really into like dinosaurs. Um, you know, and that kind of led into, uh, you know, an interest in the like lost civilizations, you mm. know, dead races uh, pretty early on, you know, like El Dorado. Um, you know, like uh, Percy Fawcett, his like, uh, journey down the Amazon and everything. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Um, yes. You know, so that kind of just like naturally uh, grew from a very, very young age. It's something, you know, as long as I could read, this is the kind of stuff that I've always been into. Um, you know, and there's been tremendous number of advances, you know, in my lifetime. Oh, yes. Um, you know, you have kind of the, you know, I was four years old when the first human genome was uh, fully sequenced. And, you know, now, it's $600 to get a full uh, genome sequence, and it was a billion 22 years ago. Um, it's just a very, very rapidly advancing field. I think there's something like 6,000 uh, ancient remains that have been DNA sequenced, which has really given us kind of a 
you know, a whole new worldview on um, prehistory. Uh, there's some eras that uh, archaeologists and linguists actually did have a pretty good understanding of, like the Bantu expansion, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, where you have this kind of very small group and, uh, you know, what's nowadays Western Cameroon, Eastern Nigeria, that, you know, just kind of exploded and, uh, you know, conquered a huge chunk of Africa and annihilated everyone that was there before. Uh, there's some er areas like um, uh, Europe, you know, in India with the Indo-European expansion, where the Indo-European expansion was actually far bloodier and far larger than uh, anyone expected. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, with radiocarbon dating and with DNA, you know, people have been able to figure out, you know, the exact breadth of these conquests, you know, get time ranges down into, you know, one to two centuries of, you know, when they arrived, when they conquered, you know, to what degree they conquered, that kind of thing. Um, you know, and you have even newer stuff, uh, stuff that's even newer than the DNA with uh, pollen sampling, um, where they're going and they're uh, looking at sites and they're looking at, you know, what are the relative densities of different types of pollen? You know, is it um, like trees and nuts? Is it, you know, grains that humans harvest? That kind of thing uh, that they can use to get kind of a proxy for what the human populations were. Um, you know, in different areas, you have environmental studies with ice cores. Um, you know, you can see the early, you know, they're kind of like proto-industrialization movements in the Roman and medieval periods. Yes, yes. You know, they can tell those from looking at the amount of lead and certain, uh, you know, and the layers of mud in uh, lakes and everything. So there's just uh, tons of stuff. It's unending. I mean, a lot of people find it boring. I completely understand. There's plenty of stuff going on in the world. You know, just something I've always really gotten into and, uh, you know, very fun hobby. Yeah, yeah. Um. It's funny you mention like uh, pollen. I guess, in in terms of the sort of what would you call it, the epigenetic character of civilizations and the types of foods that they were acclimatized to, developed into the sort of diverse civilizations that you have. But I wanted to. But you mentioned the Mantu expansion. I was reading this because um, I guess the more high minded libs go to um, what's that website Quora, where this one archaeologist was saying that. Um, only evil racists <laughs> say that the Bantu <laughs> expansion was genesis. Uh, oh, I can't say the word on Twitter. I mean, on YouTube, uh, G word idol and that the Bantus just naturally assimilated among these uh, peoples. Uh, but is there good evidence that it really was sort of annihilation of the stock of peoples that were there when the Bantus expanded? This wasn't an organic multicultural. We are the world sort of integration. Oh yeah. It's overwhelming. Um, you know, we have, you know, the Bantus are originally from, uh, well, it's going way back, um, and this is less understood just because the difficulties of getting uh, DNA from kind of tropical equatorial environments. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, you have these two, you know, you've got like the Niger River, um, you know, and there's a couple other rivers. And there were kind of two main crops that were uh, independently domesticated most likely in west africa and you know it's possible there were crops domesticated in green sahara as well you know the sahara used to be kind of a savanna fertile grassland whatever um it didn't it wasn't always a desert um even though in the ice age it was and then kind of in the neolithic it wasn't and then you know by the bronze age and to the present it's been a desert again um see so these kind of like two main uh cultivations uh, sorghum um, and millet. And, uh, you know, those, my personal guess is it was actually two separate groups that, um, you know, and there's no evidence for this other than just kind of comparative, um, you know, prehistory. Yeah. My guess is you have these like very distinctive, very isolated groups that independently develop, um, you know, these two crops. You know, and it just seems like all over the world, you know, between like 11,000 and 9,000 BC, you know, it, like there's this really weird pattern where like everywhere, everyone seems to be developing agriculture at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's some arguments over it. A lot of it has to, I think, kind of the main agreement for scientists and, you know, climate, not something I'm an expert in by any means. I'm trying to understand it, but, uh, you know, I need to do a lot more reading. Um, you know, climate became more predictable. There was less random weather. Uh, you know, people could sow a harvest and actually, uh, you know, somewhat reasonably predict that 
you know, they had like a sowing season, you know, and then a harvest season, you know, which makes agriculture worthwhile. Uh, there's some evidence for agricultural societies in the Ice Age, um, you know, in Sicily and Jordan and uh, New Guinea, as well as, uh, you know, Sri Lanka, um, you know, which is kind of just south of India. Um, you know, those societies were really abortive, though. Agricultural didn't, agriculture didn't take off there. And the guess is that, you know, weather was just kind of too random and, you know, wiped those societies out. They had too many famines and either reverted to hunting gathering or got wiped out by uh, hunting hunter gatherers. Um, so, you know, kind of 11,000 to 9,000 BC, that's when agricultural takes off everywhere. And through some very mysterious uh, population movements in uh, West Africa, uh, the ancestors of the Niger Congo peoples kind of gradually coalesced. Uh, when they did, um, you know, the Bantus are a branch of the Niger Congo peoples. Mm. Uh, when they did that, totally unknown, um, you know, very open question in archaeology, linguistics, and genetics. Um, you know, there's some people that argue it happened all the way back in 17,000 BC, which I think is too early. Um, you know, that's Christopher Hurt's view. You know, very good guy, very smart guy. I respect him a lot. Um, you know, I think he just kind of underestimates how fast languages could change in prehistory. Because for agricultural, you know, a lot of the comparisons we have historically are with agricultural societies, right? Right. Um, you know, they have larger populations. They have, uh, you know, kind of cultural specialists, particularly when they have writing. You start yeah, they to started see, developing like, writing and, and sort of oral traditions before that. That They were solidified in that period, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So you start to have this linguistic conservatism where, you know, people are looking back on these, you know, oral traditions. Um, you know, like Sanskrit, for instance, survived into the present era, mm -hmm. um, you know, just kind of as an oral tradition. Um, even though kind of the local Indian languages, you know, it all, you know, colloquially developed uh, far beyond that. Um, so, you know, like the Indian languages were still adopting words from Sanskrit, like into the modern era. Um, I mean, I think even today, like there's a, uh, you know, movement within Hindi to try to Sanskritize it. Um, you know, make words more Indian rather than English. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure how well it's caught on. Um, you know, but stuff like that has been going on for, you know, thousands and thousands of years, and it's made uh, linguistic change a lot more conservative than, uh, you know, some of these people believe. So, you know, they're looking at the changes in languages in the historical period that they actually have references for, and that causes them to put the divergences of these language families like Niger-Congo, uh, for instance, um, you know, a lot further back than I think they actually were. Uh, my guess is the Niger-Congo uh, language family, to the extent that it's real. Um, you know, there's a lot of work that needs to be done on it, uh, you know, on the linguistics end. Um, you know, my guess is when it all comes out, it's going to be spoken, uh, you know, probably seven, 6,000 BC would be mm. my guess. Um, so you have kind of this consolidation of these uh, West African groups. Um, and some of these West African groups, uh, interestingly, uh, you actually have kind of um, archaeologically, you know, there's a difference between the Middle Stone Age, which is supposed to kind of die out, uh, you know, in 50,000 BC and, you know, around the world. Uh, it actually survives in parts of uh, Africa, you know, into, you know, the last couple thousand years in some places. Hmm. And in West Africa, I believe it doesn't die out until about 7,000 BC. And the Middle Stone Age is interesting because it's not necessarily, you know, like Neanderthals had access to it, for instance. Um, you know, it's a toolkit that was not necessarily human in uh, origin. And there's some suggestions, you know, and it's very disputed amongst geneticists. Uh, there's very smart people, much smarter than me, that have made convincing cases, uh, both for and against, um, you know, that there is a... Uh, a significant amount of non-human ancestry in West Africans, um, you know, more substantial than the non-human ancestry that we see in uh, you know, Eurasians, Amerindians, and in uh, Australian Aborigines. Uh, what that species was, kind of unknown. Uh, you know, it's again, it's very difficult to uh, you know find remains in West Africa due to tropical conditions. Um, you know, but there's some stuff like there's a, a allele for saliva. You know, which appears to have diverged from the main alleles for saliva, you know, over a million years ago, you know, and it's only found in West Africans. Uh, so for whatever reason, you know, that mixing in with, uh, 
whatever this creature or creatures were in West Africa, you know, the uh, saliva that it had proved more advantageous for whatever reason. Um, as... Oh, go ahead. Did I cut you off? Oh, yeah. So, I mean, you know, there's definitely a lot going on. Um, you know, these prehistoric societies, they like in the Paleolithic, they would kind of like monopolize a certain ecology. Um, you know, they would learn how to like, you know, one, they would have the adaptation for the local diseases, which is very important. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you like in the past, you know, and I, like today it's not, it's different, you know, where everything's very homogenized and even people in like Africa and, uh, you know, Southeast Asia, where they have a lot of contact with nature, you know, it's the same pigs, it's the same chickens, you, you know, um, you have invasive species that kind of take over the different ecologies. There's, you know, some people call it the homogenocene, you know, where there's this great equaling of all these species everywhere. Um, you know, so the disease pressures, you know, the diseases that generate could have come from anywhere in a lot of cases. Um, you know, and there are exceptions, you know, like protein, I think, came from some sort of like jungle creature or something that doesn't really exist outside of uh, Southeast Asia, you know, in the Yunnan province of China. Yeah, um, like, you know, yeah. but back in the age, back in the day, like the Paleolithic, everything was a local species. Um, you know, everything was hyper localized. You know, everyone had these ad adaptations for these, you know, local diseases that other groups couldn't really, you know, resist. And it made for this very, you know, localized patchwork and diverse humanity. Um, yeah. That's... You know, and... Oh, yeah. Sorry, go ahead. Uh, what were you going to say? Oh, I was just going to say about um, the sort of the nature of, of um, prehistory and how I'm noticing that there is a greater sort of emphasis on exploring. It, it seems that, you know, these, the, the sort of genetic history of humanity is sort of crossing into the sort of mythologization of the origins of different peoples. And I noticed that um, it's becoming more of a popular motif now, at least in sort of distant circles to explore these possibilities. But, but yeah, finish your point out. We'll, we'll get into that a little later because I find this sort of uh, the mass, um, rising of ag uh, the sort of rising of agriculture at the same time that's also a very interesting point i know like um people more uh myth mythologically inclined would say that there was an axial age and that this knowledge sort of transmitted throughout the earth in various ways but perhaps the climate had a huge part to do with it but uh sorry i, I cut you off <laughs> yeah go ahead oh good yeah i'm just sorry for going on this like oh no problem, you know, no problem. african prehistory is really fascinating um so you have like all these different groups in West Africa, and I think kind of the two main agricultural groups, you know, largely overrun them, even though these, uh, you know, and this is where, you know, it's very possible that the Middle Stone Age groups were just wiped out entirely and didn't mm. have any um, survivors. The range for the, you know, when the non-human ancestry uh, was introduced into West Africans, you know, is pretty old. Um, you know, there's some, you know, the range is really wide just because there hasn't been, you know, there haven't been any finds of this uh, creature or creatures. Uh, you know, there's some estimates that say it could have been as late as I think, you know, like 10,000 BC. Uh, you know, and there's other things that say it could have been as early as 50,000 BC. Hmm. Um, you know, so a little bit before, you know, our ancestors mixed with the uh, ancestors, you know, mixed with the Neanderthals in the Middle East. Um, so, you know, a lot of unknowns. Uh, so anyhow, uh, you know, the kind of Middle Stone Age peoples, they all get wiped out, you know, by uh, the Neolithic. You know, that's when agriculture starts to spread. Um, you know, there's uh, first like an aceramic period. They don't have ceramics. They're wiped out before that. Uh, you know, and then eventually have the uh, spread of West African ceramics. Um, you know, so in this period, you have, uh, you know, the Sahara starts to green up. Um, and, you know, there are a number of peoples that apparently no longer exist anymore, you know, in pure form, um, you know, which contribute ancestry to both uh, North Africans as well as, um, you know, Sub-Saharan Africans, you know, that are kind of living in the Green Sahara at that point. And it was a very diverse period, um, you know, like there was, 
you know, one group of uh, people that was living there, it was like six feet tall. I mean, they were giants. Mm. Um, yeah. You know, unfortunately, we don't have any DNA fr from them. I really hope we do. I think we have a couple skeletons. Um, you know, there's evidence that they had, you know, they had boats that they could sail around lakes and that kind of thing. Um, and then later you have a migration of people who have a lot of uh, ancestry from these Middle Eastern farmers who, you know, they kind of take two routes to uh, North Africa. Um, you know, one of them, and they go through Europe where they, you know, are about uh, Italian, right? Sicilian. Oh, yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah, well, so, uh, mostly Calabria is on the sort of uh, the Greek side, but yeah, a little bit of central Italian, but Calabria is, yeah. <laughs> gotcha, yeah. So, you know, the farmers that go from the Middle East to Europe, you know, they're like 60, 65% of your ancestors, you know, like I'm mm. nor more Northern Europeans, there may be like 40, 45% of my ancestors, um, you know, so very big population move. Uh, you know, so they kind of like roll through, um, you know, the Balkans, going to Germany, Italy, Spain, you know, the branch that goes to Spain, they actually get taken over by a local group of hunter gatherers, you know, and mixed in. So they're like, you know, 85% Middle Eastern farmer, 15% Spanish hunter gatherer. And they go to North Africa, they replace like half the population there between uh, 4400 and 3800 BC. And, you know, they somehow cross the, uh, you know, Green Sahara. So this, this um, is Tunisia and Morocco and those that had contact with Spain, those type of uh, areas? Yes. Okay. Oh, that makes sense, actually. Yeah. And, you know, even today, like people in, a, you know, kind of northwestern Africa are like 50% of this, uh, you know, early European farmer um, ancestry. You know, those farmers that moved into uh, Europe from the Middle East. Um, you know, so that's why you see like a lot of North African people that are very uh, Mediterranean. I mean, that's basically the Mediterranean look, right? It's this, oh, yes. <laughs> uh, you know, the Anatolian farmers, the early European farmers, whatever you want to call them. Like, you know, that's that's where kind of the med, uh, you know, phenotype comes from. Um, you know, and Sardinians are kind of like the best example because they're like eighty percent. That's right. That, yes. uh, yeah. Yeah, they're like 80% Anatolian or early European farmer, whatever you want to call it in ancestry. Um, so anyhow, like this. Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Uh, so this farmer group kind of migrates down south. Um, you know, some of them apparently reach kind of South Sudan and, uh, you know, kind of extreme western part of Ethiopia, probably following the, uh, the Nile. Um, and some of them penetrate all the way down to uh, southern Chad. Um, but the you know, the Sahara is drying out while they're doing this migration. So it kind of shields the, uh, you know, people from uh, of West Africa from, uh, you know, these invasions. Um, so the people from West Africa, they don't, they have very little of this uh, kind of farmer ancestry from the Middle East, um, you know, either transmitted via Europe or, you know, via the kind of the Levant, you know, Israel, yeah. Jordan, Egypt, that area, uh, they probably have a lot more if, you know, because the Middle Eastern peoples that are kind of crossing the, um, you know, the Green Sahara, they're a lot more advanced. They have, you know, various, you know, they have goats, pigs, all that stuff. Um, and it's one of the, you know, I kind of mentioned that like lost race that contributes ancestry both to Sub-Saharan Africans as well as uh, North Africans in a small amount. You know, and that's the race that uh, from Green Sahara that can, you know, mixed in with the, um, you know, this uh, kind of the proto um, West African peoples, you know, what we consider black. Like, yeah. you know, we look at Ethiopians and Somalis and we like know that they're different from blacks. And it's because they are like they barely they're closer to us in ancestry than they are West Africans. So, you know, I don't even call like Somalis and Ethiopians black like they're their own totally separate race. Um, so they, in West they Africa, do have a lot of Mediterranean in them as well. Like the same with a lot. Lebanese, I believe, have a lot of Mediterranean. Um, yeah. Yeah. Like Ethiopians and uh, in particular. Of tons you know there's uh like the queen of sheba for instance um you know that like i think i'm convinced that that um it's like a trade mission from the uh semitic peoples when they're you know migrating across the red sea to invade ethiopia 
because uh, Ethiopia, interestingly, way back then, was inhabited by this race of like dwarves. Um, <laughs> you know, they were very, uh, uh, I can't pronounce the word, it's like Stiagipus or something. You know, they had very fat uh, butts. Um, they have you know, this sort of longhouse like a... mother physiognomy going on. Yeah, you know, kind of short, fat butts. Um, <laughs> you know, pygmy. They weren't related at all to the pygmies of Central Africa. Um, you know, but they had that kind of look. And I guess they lived for up in the Ethiopian highlands for a really long time, uh, you know, because they had a special altitude um, adaptations. You know, they could reproduce and live up there in a way that other humans couldn't or uh, found difficult. Um, you know, and the Egyptians actually have a bunch of records of them and, like, trade missions with them. I mean, not a lot of records, but they have uh, some records and, like, artwork and stuff. Um so yeah, Ethiopia in the Bronze Age was totally, totally different looking place. Um, you know, all the people that have showed up there now are like these uh, late Bronze Age invaders. Um, you know, but they don't have anything to do with the, uh, the Bantu, really. Mm. Uh, so in West Africa, you have, you know, this, you know, kind of two main agricultural groups mixed in with whatever this Green Sahara group was. And kind of the, uh, you know, the far eastern end of what's nowadays... Um, you know, Eastern Nigeria and Western Cameroon, you know, they, you have like all these mountains and highlands and it was a, um environment that was very kind of inhospitable to these uh, kind of millet and uh, sorghum farm or uh, yam farmers mm. and uh, whatever. Um, so you had these hunter gatherers, uh, which we actually have some DNA from, which is very neat, you know, very, very distinctive from the Bantus, like totally different. Um, you know, I think we're closer to Chinese than the ancestors, the Bantu or to, uh, you know, these people living in the highlands of, uh, Western Cameroon. Very interesting. And the, uh, people in Western Cameroon, um, they're a Y haplo group. You know, the lineage that's passed down without modification from father to son um, is actually very distinctive. Uh, they have the A00 haplogroup. So originally, like, you know, 15 years ago, people were like, oh, the Y chromosomal Adam, he lived in Ethiopia maybe 60, 80,000 years ago, and he had the A haplogroup. Um, you know, and then it turned out that there was actually an A0 haplogroup that was actually, like, way more divergent and put you know, human differences, you know, the split for mankind back to like, you know, 150, 160,000 years ago. And then, uh, like, I think it was about a decade ago, um, some genetic counselor was talking to some uh, black guy in Maryland, and they found out that he was an A00 haplogroup, you know, that split back way, all the way back, like 230 to uh, 200,000, 270,000 years ago. Hmm. Um so this uh, genetic counselor in Maryland, she actually went out, she uh, crowdfunded this expedition, and she did kind of like this uh, primitive S2R tests, um, you know, not a very high resolution. They're just looking at the Y chromosomes, um, you know, and actually found there's these like uh, tribes in the highlands, uh, they're Bantu speaking, um, of uh, Western Cameroon that, you know, something like 40 to 60 percent of them have this A00 haplogroup. Um, and it's actually very rare amongst Bantus. Like most Bantus do not have this, um, you know, so it's kind of a puzzle and archeologically what it looks like happened is around 3000 BC. So the same time that the Indo-Europeans launched their, uh, you know, massive invasion of Europe, um, you know, the Bantus, they actually start to push down kind of the river valleys. Uh, you know, through Cameroon and the Congo. Um, and what I think happened was, you know, they're colonizing these kind of agricultural uh, riverine areas, you know, that they know how to build, uh, you know, kind of basic irrigation, build footpaths through forests, that kind of thing. But they can't really penetrate deep into the jungle where you still have a lot of kind of surviving uh, pygmies, um, have like this black pig herder race, which is kind of mysterious. Um, you know, but has once at least one remnant in um, southern Chad mm. uh, called the Lao people who speak a language that's not related to any other language in the world. Um, you know, and the Lao, interestingly, are they have a lot of male line ancestry from that kind of group of uh, 
you know, early European farmers that got conquered by the uh, Iberian, you know, Spanish hunter-gatherers that kind of migrated across the um, uh, Green Sahara. So, you know, very mysterious story there that more research is needed. Yeah, perhaps um, they probably mixed with those original settlers from that sort of European phenotype, and then maybe they moved inwards, you figure, or? Yeah, I mean, it, it looks like kind of the, you know, I don't, I don't like using European before 2200 BC. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, let me, we'll get into, <laughs> we'll get into that a little bit, but yeah, yeah. Go yeah. Ahead. Yeah. Yeah. I call them the early European farmers, even if they have the, uh, you know, European, you know, the hunter gatherer, the Western hunter gatherer ancestry. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it looks like at some point, you know, a tribe of those took over a tribe of these kind of like, uh, black pig herders, you know, there's this like African species of these small black pigs, um, you know, just kind of got absorbed into them, um, you know, because their ancestry is only like three or four percent of that, uh, you know, early European farmer, hmm. um, you know, and there's like their neighboring tribe, I think is like half a percent of that ancestry, um, you know, so it's a very weird story how they ended up there. But anyhow, it doesn't have anything to do with the Bantus, just kind of a, you know, another ephemeral, um, you know, wandering of peoples that we can barely detect in this day and age. Uh, so the Bantus are expanding through the uh, kind of river Rhine areas, and they still have all these very diverse hunter-gatherers hiding out in the uh, jungles and um, in the, uh, you know, highlands, because, you know, they don't know how to their crops just can't grow that high. Like a lot of the crops they've limit, you know, they can't take too much water, too little water. Um, you know, there's certain weeds they can't necessarily compete with. Uh, elevation ca causes issues for uh, plants as well. Um, so a lot of these highlands remain uh, inhabited by the ancestors of uh, certain groups of these people for a very, very long time. So they go and they make their expansion and uh, they eventually kind of hit a limit. And actually, let me pull my notes up. Um, the Twitter thread on it a while back. Does that all make sense? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think that, uh, but it's, it's the Bantu expansion. This is happening. Um, and I guess certain pockets were by virtue of their geography and by virtue, I guess, of being still retaining their hunter gatherer skill forced by the environment, of course, that they sort of were immune from this expansion by the Bantus, but then did these holdouts eventually get conquered by them or? Um... Yes. Yeah. And also it's funny, like you mentioned how they have even <laughs> the near Cameroon Asiatic genetic makeup, which is very fascinating. I mean, in some ways, maybe the current uh, Chinese colonization of those people, <laughs> maybe it's like the Chinese are coming home. Who knows? Right. But uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, oh, I mean, that was just specifically that one small mm. group, like most of the, Bantus don't have that much. Um, you know, the Eurasian, you know, any Eurasian for anyone from Asia, Europe, or the Middle East, yeah. you know, or India, um, you know, they were penetrating deeper, but the Sahara uh, dried up for. And do you, um, but do you have a theory, though, on the sort of the root race that shares, um, that contributed genes to both? West Africans and North Africans. Do you do you believe that there was a previous, let's say, ancient civilization, or there was a previous phenotype that was there? Um, I know, like again, a lot of this crosses over into mythologizing. But what is your sort of um, theory as to why there is this unknown um, genetic variant within these people? Um, I mean, I think we just need to do more digging in the Sahara. Unfortunately, it's really dangerous. No one will. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, we have actually some skeletons uh, from, you know, uh, of them, just no DNA, unfortunately. Um, you know, and it's very possible, like one kind of sad thing in history is it looks like the farmers were dumber than the hunter gatherers. Hmm. You know, they lived very kind of rigid lives, um, that enabled stupid people to survive more, um, you know, very predictable and everything. Um. So our schools are actually smaller, like the, uh, you know, the schools of these ibero Mirajan people um, and are actually massive for like six, like 1600 or, uh, you know, like 
1650 um, cubic centimeters in volume. You know, I think the average man's now is like 1450 or something. Um, so, you know, they were probably smarter than us, uh, but, you know, probably smarter in a different way. My guess is they would have been a lot more perceptive about their environment, but not necessarily, uh, you know, able, and they probably would have been a lot more impulsive to, um, you know, not have that, those kind of ingrained habit habits and discipline to, uh, you know, cow toe to the leader or whatever, like we do. So we're dumber and more con um, sociable uh, than those people. And they were also tall, too. I think they were like six foot. Um, so, and that's something we see across the world, too. The hunter gatherers were, uh, you know, taller and healthier than their uh, successors. Yeah, that's... So, yes, or the retards who uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> conquered. It's a, well, it's almost a, a theory cell point would be um, the, the writer, the, well, the critical theorist, uh, Scott, uh, George Scott, he wrote that book, Seeing Like a State, and how he, uh, you know, takes various strands from Heidegger and Foucault, and he talks about how this, well, I guess even Alul would say the technique develops at the earliest stages and how the sort of rudimentary nature of um, very innate practices versus what we would know today as technique that the hunter gatherers sort of a, when they became agricultural, they lost their sort of innate ability, what he calls Mati knowledge. Um, and it's very, it's very fascinating actually how the sort of uh, the, the nature of technique when it comes to agricultural society, how that in, in itself, even at the earliest stages dramatically affects people's innate ability towards their environment, towards um, intelligence in general, or I guess spatial and technical intelligence. It's very, uh, but so it's, it's almost like to make an argument is that nowadays we live in an incredibly over advanced, uh, over socialized society. Um, but it's interesting because you're not exactly what you would, I would call a trad or, um, or like a, a varge pilled or something like that. You're very much, you have a very, um, I would say is futurist the right word, or maybe not. It, it seems that you are aware of the ability of technique to atrophy certain innate abilities, but, uh, but, but what do you make of, I, I'm just rambling right now. Like what, what do you make of this sort of revelation that technique from its earliest stages and I, I mean, look at what society's like nowadays when it comes to like plummeting IQ rates and so forth. Like, what do you, what do you make of all of this? Um, well, you know, man makes society, but society makes man too. I mean, we've basically domesticated ourselves, and that we're, <laughs> uh, you know, um, at least in our case, you know, I'm mostly Northern European in ancestry with a bit of a Amerindian. Um, you know, we thankfully. Uh, descended from these steppe nomads in a large part and you have a lot too in southern europe as well um you know who did not grow shorter like a lot of other people mm. uh you know we didn't take up agriculture until 4200 years ago um you know so we stayed tall but still got domesticated uh you know white skin funnily enough is actually a, a mm. you know probably a sign of domestication um you know so we have that too uh, and, you know, it's kind of interesting, like across the world, people seem to get lighter uh, in skin tone as soon yeah. as they adapt to agriculture. You know, you see that in the Americas, in Europe, in Asia, and, um, you know, India is kind of the uh, opposite, but they have some, there's a lot more work that needs to be done in prehistoric India. Um, you know, they definitely have their own kind of, you know, large historical genetic processes going on there. Oh, yes. Um, oh, yes. You know, and they could have been due to, you know, widespread veganism. Um, you know, that could have, uh, not veganism, vegetarianism, I think. Um, so, yeah, society definitely uh, does make men, you know, uh, made a shorter, barrier, wider, um, but also less crazy, too. Um, you know, schizophrenia doesn't have, you know, one cause. It's kind of like a, con you know, if just a bunch of traits that can come together in a constellation and uh, make you crazy. Um, you know, for hunter gatherers, craziness wasn't necessarily that big of a deal. Um, it was almost a fat, like it was almost in some ways a motivating force or it was, um, it was well mythologized as well. Like, uh, 
but then that's the argument like is is there something genuinely going on there or is it sort of like a modernist uh you know oh these people just they were just mentally ill when they saw visions or whatnot uh, but yeah it, w it wasn't necessarily as we code it nowadays as a negative right yeah i mean you know it was part of life in a mystical sense like people believed they actually were seeing visions and could see the future you know and these uh you know they had to appease various spirits to uh you know, otherwise they would seize control of people who would go on murderous rampages or, you know, end up in stupors, that kind of thing. Hmm. Um, you know, so kind of, you know, people's had to make sense of it. I remember reading, um, you know, I read a biography of Martin Luther, you know, and he kind of described, say, a demonically possessed child that, you know, today we would recognize as a child with autism. Hmm. Maybe autism um, is sort of demonic. No, I'm kidding. Yeah, yeah that, you know, I mean, it's not wrong to think that way. If you're going to put uh, a kind of a, you know, if you view reality very spiritually, you know, you could very much understand that as a form of demonic possession. Or demonic, you know, I think that's, not necessarily, well, of course, not Christian connotation negative, but sort of the day, this, the daemon is probably um, in well, prehistory as well. That idea is probably there. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's not a world, I think, literary. I like it as a kind of literary worldview, stylistically. <laughs> um, you know, and I understand why people like to understand reality that way and, you know, kind of through a spiritual lens. Um, but, you know, like, I find it interesting. I just don't believe it in myself, if that makes sense. Would you consider yourself... Uh, I, it seems nobody's asked you this, but uh, what are your uh, spiritual beliefs or lack thereof? And then, I mean, there's so many things to discuss, but you, would you consider yourself... Um, atheist or agnostic or do you believe in uh yeah go ahead <laughs> I, mean, I know it's a pretty open question there but you know yeah i'm a calvinist atheist if that makes any sense i mean i grew up presbyterian um you know don't believe in god or anything but uh you know i mean it's like just such a deep part of the worldview you know going back you know i think my uh ancestors have been calvinists for probably 400 years now hmm. Um, you know, so it's just part of my heritage, I guess. It's uh, not something I don't think I'll ever want to or be able to grow beyond. Um, that you know, it, I, I think like makes sense in the Calvinist perspective. Uh, well, sorry, go ahead, go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, I've noticed for like Catholics in particular, um, you know, Muslims as well. You know, you can never really like grow beyond your religion, even if you become an atheist. Mm -hmm. Um. You know, it's always going to be like the way <laughs> it's hard to explain, you know, you know, like religions, they're, they're holistic worldviews, you know, you can understand all of reality through religion and people did, you know, it's, uh, you know, kind of rationalism, even though it's appeared uh, a number of times through history, um, you know, it's rationalism has always found it's very difficult to avoid being taken over by religious views and you know religious views in like kind of a emotional sense you know because you have like marxist leninism yeah which uh, very much had a lot of um you know religious uh took on a lot of religious aspects as it became a uh, widespread ideology yeah even um, um even in india i mean they had shavaka um that were yeah. materialist but then they sort of uh it's not that they were conquered per se physically. It's just that they sort of, they died out like the, the, the sort of the school of philosophy and the school of belief sort of, or lack thereof, like sort of just went by the wayside and then Buddhism of course came along and yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, it's kind of funny in the sense that, uh, you know, I don't know what your religious beliefs are, but religion well, is Catholic. definitely a positive yeah, social <laughs> adaptation. Um, in an atheistic, rationalistic societies uh, don't survive. <laughs> yeah, well, so. like, as a Catholic, I mean, a cradle Catholic, uh, I mean, I believe, but it pretty much is a sort of what I call a genetic religion for us Italians nowadays. So, um, yeah, but uh, we, so we were talking about the origins. Um, when it comes to, the, like, the earliest of civilizations, I know like the the contentious sort of orthodoxy is like the out of Africa theory and sort of, you know, the guns, dreams and steel stuff. But uh, do you have um, and, and also at, it seems that in distant spaces, there is, like I said, this awareness of looking at the origins of these various steppe peoples. 
Um, and what's in what's interesting with you though, is that you don't, um, I wouldn't say that you're a Nordicist per se. It's that you, you do recognize the sort of the Greco Roman aspect, the sort of, uh, the Bantu expansion, and you're not sort of, uh, Im I would say impulsively Nordicist in this regard or Northern European. You do have a great interest in the Mediterranean. Um, I know, I know, I know your friend uh, Bleep Sama said once that uh, no no real Roman stepped into Rome until the uh, the God, the Visigoths went there. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> you know. uh, but but yeah. So uh, what what would you do? You agree with the sort of uh, out of Africa theory, or do you have a more multipolar theory of human origins? Or uh, yeah. I mean, the out of Africa theory. It's um, it's a good like. It's a good theory. I mean, it's like a rough understanding. Most of the vast majority of our ancestors did indeed leave Africa, mm. you know, probably between 70 and 60,000 years ago, specifically East Africa, most likely. Um, you know, that being said, you know, we are, we did mix with Neanderthals, um, you know, East Asians mixed with, uh, you know, Denisovans too. And, you know, within Africa, you know, like I was telling you, with the survival of these uh, possibly non-human Middle Stone Age groups into mm. the uh, Neolithic, um, you know, there very much were like other hominids kind of wandering around that we interacted with, um, you know, but they only comprise like a small portion of our ancestry, you know, maybe like 4% for us. So, but the fact you know, that they some... were there is quite, like revealing. I mean, you were mentioning the human genome project. I remember, um, I read Francis Collins book and, uh, he was part of the team. If I recall, they were competing against Craig Vanter, the private, you know, the, the venture capitalist, and he had his own scientists and, uh, but, but it, it is fascinating though, the fact that there were these sort of different hominids like walking around and, you know, I mean the whole Neanderthal, the takeover theory as well. I mean, but yeah, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. I, I cut you off. Uh, where was I even going with my, uh, I'm sorry, I was just looking for my Bantu notes again. What was I even saying? Oh, about the out of Africa theory. <laughs> sorry. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's all I have to say, really. Just, yeah, like most of our ancestors did come from uh, East Africa. Um, I know there's some people, they're arguing for an out of the Levant or out of Arabia, you yeah. know, which could be possible. But it's definitely kind of like that area around the Red Sea. Um you know, it doesn't make sense for it to be, uh, you know, maybe out of Egypt, who knows. But, uh, yeah, I, I lean towards out of East Africa. But, you know, I'm open to out of Arabia and out of out of the Levant has issues, too. Um, you know, like the Neanderthal ancestry, you know, because the Neanderthals were in the Levant as well. Yeah. Like, I think we would have had um, more, more of it if uh, out of the Levant was true. Um, you know, so I think, like... You know, out of uh, East Africa, out of, uh, you know, Arabia make a lot of sense, though. Yeah, I think, yeah, I mean, because there is a lot of variables that would have to be discovered if it was out of the Levant. But uh, in, in terms of, if we're jumping ahead, though, in terms of European civilization as European, when do you, um, when you hear the words European civilization, what comes to mind for you in your perspective, and if there is such a thing as European civilization, um, I mentioned the sort of Nordicist bent that a lot of people have. Um, but from your perspective, I mean, do you lean towards the sort of Indo Arab, you know, Indo Aryan sort of thesis, or um, is it more Greco Roman? You know, I mean, I guess if you were to define Europe as Faustian man, uh, what, what, when do you think is the real culmination of when you hear the words European civilization? Um, so, you know, a lot of people, I think, you know, in our circles tend to conflate, you know, the white race and Western civilization, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, so I think they actually have two origins that are actually quite apart from each other. In time. Uh, so the white race, you know, as we would recognize it, uh, was formed in kind of the late third millennium BC, you know, after the uh, Indo-European invasions have taken over most of Europe mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, they've conquered all of the, uh, or most of, I should say, the uh, kind of farming societies that descend from the uh, uh, migrants from what's now in days Turkey, from the Middle East. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, you know, and that's like genetically when people that are like you and me, um, you know, would have first kind of been around. 
Um, you know, and that process mostly finished in Europe around 2200 BC, um, even though, of course, there were a, uh, a lot of differences. Like Greeks, for instance, were uh, the classical Greeks and the uh, Bronze Age Greeks were very, very different from the Greeks today. Um, you know, Italians have a fair amount of differences too. Um, you know, and even people in like Spain and uh, Northern Europe were a bit different, but mm -hmm. they would have been recognizable somewhat, even if they would have been, you know, darker in skin. Most of them couldn't drink milk. Um, you know, they would have been a little bit crazier, like schizos would have been more noticeable, that kind of thing. Um, but, but I mean, I think that's when, you know, kind of 2800 to 2200 BC, that's when we see the formation of a recognizable white race, you know, as the mm -hmm. results of the uh, Indo-European expansion into Europe. Um, and, you know, I, I think, too, there would have been a recognizable white race uh, deep into Siberia and uh, Central Asia and uh, into Iran as well. Um, you know, one kind of funny thing about ancient DNA research is it's shown, you know, like that movie uh, 300 from like 15 years ago. Yeah. You know, yeah, yeah. basically like this racist movie where if these like swarthy uh, Middle Eastern <laughs> Persians fighting against these like all these like very Nordic looking uh, British yeah, actors. Yeah, are, yeah like, there were up. Greeks, really. They were Nords. Yeah. <laughs> That's like the Bleep yeah. Sama thesis of the Greeks. <laughs> yeah. yeah and, but... You know, the funny thing is uh, the Nordicists were totally wrong about Greece but totally right about Rome. It's actually very, very funny because, uh, you know, and, and that's the way it is for like a lot of uh, theories for ancient history. You know, you have like certain theories, they'll be like totally right in one way and then like completely wrong in mm. the other. Yeah. So, uh, you know, modern Greeks are only like half, only like half their ancestors, if that were classical Greeks and, you know, probably less, honestly. Um, you know, it's just there were a lot of other, like, related peoples that were kind of floating around. I mean, you know, the Greeks even admitted that huge numbers of slaves. Um, you know, but the main thing yeah. is, like, this massive invasion of Slavs pours in in the Dark Ages. Um, you know, and the Byzantine writers all talk about it, you know, and replace, like, half the population of Greece. Uh, I, I know, like, one friend who, uh, you know, actually studied Greek. You know, he said that modern Greek is like a ancient Greek with the Slavic accent, you know, and that's exactly what it is. Like there was a massive, massive Slavic invasion of the Balkans. Well, then you get countries um, like Macedonia. My friend uh, is Macedonian. He says, uh, well, he thinks the future Macedonia is in the Slavic world rather than clinging on to their Greek ancestry. But then you is so countries like Macedonia, they come out of this invasion or expansion of the Slavoid peoples into Greece. Yes. Right? Very interesting. Yes. Yeah. And it massively changed, you know, they became much, much more uh, Indo-European kind of step in ancestry than they had been before. Wow. Like at the time of Alexander the Great and like Pericles and all of them, they were like five, 10% at most uh, Indo-European in ancestry. Um, you know, it would have been more closely related to like Armenians and stuff. You know, they had a lot of like Caucasian ancestry. Caucasoid, uh, you know, yeah. Yeah, and, you know, but by far, you know, that, like, Anatolian farmer ancestry, early European farmer ancestry, that would have been the dominant component of their ancestry. Wow, that's that's and fascinating, well, though, because people, like, I know a lot of uh, well, a lot of people that we know, actually, would say that uh, Alexander the Great was, a, you know, an Aryan steppe warrior and, uh, he you know, Indo-Aryan European, but you're saying that, in fact, it was more so the, the pure, I guess, Greek farmer phenotype that was more present within the expansion from alexander the great not the indo-european i mean i could well, be wrong just genotype like phenotypes yeah. can be very broad i mean there's guys who are mostly uh you know northern european in ancestry like myself that nonetheless end up looking like like it passes anything anyone from morocco to punjab you know, very dark <laughs> you know yeah. swarthy black hair um you know so like i mean there's people in armenia that have blonde hair and blue eyes that's right um you know, I mean, there's like it's a genotype doesn't necessarily equal. A, there's a lot of variation, I should say. So, you know, Alexander, I mean, I believe it. He probably was blonde haired and blue eyed. But mm -hmm. genotypically, you know, he was not Nordic by any means. Um, you know, he was very much part of a, a Mediterranean world. And Greece, like classical Greece, was much more integrated uh, genetically, politically, economically, culturally but with that kind of Eastern Mediterranean world than it was with the rest of Europe. Um, you know, I actually wrote up a sub stack where I kind of summarize all the, uh, um, you know, findings, uh, 
you know, Greece, in my opinion, um, didn't really become part of, you know, the West in a sense, <laughs> uh, you know, up until that massive Slavic uh, invasion, you know, and kind of the spread of Orthodoxy. Um, wow, very, very interesting. I mean, they, they, they tend to, I, I guess, they're, they're the rival interpretations between the sort of Nordicist and the Greco-Roman, but you're saying that it, it seems that up until recently, the Slavic sort of uh, element has been sort of ignored, but now I, I'm noticing that um, there is more of a recognition of it now. But but you so you were saying that there, there were sort of two civilizations. So you mentioned the Greeks. Uh, sorry if I cut you off. Uh, I'm destroying your train sure. of thought, Nimitz. I'm very sorry. Oh, no, but, okay. uh, yeah. Uh, so I mean, one thing too is, you know, races and civilizations aren't. You know, they don't live forever. Right. Um, you know, like the Greeks today aren't really the Greeks of the past. Um, yeah, they have the same identity. Yeah, they, you know, harken back to its culture. Um, and, you know, the language is real. But they've, you know, gone through really um, kind of three race changes. Or I guess, let's see. Because, you know, they start off originally, you know, they're hanging out with the ancestors, the Armenians, the Iranians, and the steppe in Ukraine, right? Yeah. They're kind of these nomadic horsemen. Um, you know, and then they go and they participate in the invasion of the Balkans. You know, they conquer Greece around 2200 BC. And, uh, you know, we actually have some DNA samples, um, you know, as late as 1700 BC. You know, the uh, ancestors of, you know, the cultural linguistic ancestors of the Greece, uh, and kind of like Macedonia, um, you know, northern Greece, uh, they go and they're like 40% Indo-European in ancestry, 40% like local, you know, pre-Hellenic um, Greek in ancestry. So it's kind of like, you know, so they stayed that way for hundreds yeah. of years. And then when we have the kind of end of the Bronze Age, like the Mycenaean um, DNA stuff, that's when they're only like 5% to 10%, uh, you know, Indo-European in ancestry. And the rest is that kind of like pre-Indo-European um, Greek and ancestry. So you have like these um, two race changes <laughs> within the Bronze Age itself. And then you have this third race change when, you know, the Slavs kind of invade, mm -hmm. you know, in the Dark Ages, and they kind of like um, bleach, for lack of a better <laughs> word, you know, they add all this uh, extra Indo-European ancestry to the uh, modern Greeks and make them, you know, much more similar to, um, you know, Europeans than, uh, you know, previously, where they're more similar to peoples in uh, Anatolia and the Middle East. They kind of like drag them genetically into uh, the Western world. Um, but also, I think into intellectually as well. I mean, you you still have in terms of the the Slavic component. I mean, Orthodoxy was obviously really big. This is when the Orthodox took off. Um, but you still have within that. You still have, I guess, the lingering Platonism, the sort of thought of Hellenization that is in the background as well. And it seems that there is a crisscross between the Slavic world and that Greek world. I mean, that's. So I wonder, can you comment on that as well? I mean, it, it's not just the genetics of a people, but it's the ideas of a people, I guess, that transform as well, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, so, you know, the Greeks go through three race changes in their history. And, uh, you know, they go through a number of civilizational changes as well. You know, they leave the, uh, you know, first they're in that kind of step world that isn't even really a civilization. I mean, it's just kind of like these savage war bands that... You know, like mutilate animals. And, the the blonde know. beasts, as Nietzsche would say. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, they weren't even really that blonde, but um, yeah. I mean, they were beasts for sure. I mean, <laughs> they were just savages. You know, they just like mutilate people in horrible ways, and kind of like end civilization wherever they came. Um, you know, and then they develop into that kind of. I don't think it was like Mycenaean, but what was the? I think it was like the Hellenic culture. Let me uh, pull up Wikipedia. Mycenaeans, I think, are only yeah. So Mycenaeans are like seventeen fifty to ten fifty BC. Mm. So they were preceded by. Um, let me here the shaft grave culture. Mm. It looks like yes, yeah, so they had kind of um, you know, first they start off with like a synthesis between the. Uh, um, you know, step invaders and like the locals when they're still like 40% Indo-European, um, you know, and then as they gradually, 
get assimilated by the far more numerous peoples of southern Greece. Uh, you know, they keep, you know, they adopt a lot of aspects of their religion and society, mm -hmm. most notably seafaring. Like the Indo Europeans originally, uh, you know, were not much of a seafaring people. Um, but interesting in, in both the Baltic, the North Sea, and in the uh, Aegean, in the Mediterranean, they uh, picked up seafaring pretty quickly. Hmm. You know, they were very much a, uh, you know, from nomad raiders to sea pirates, um, kind of a interesting evolution. Um, yeah, so they go through, I, I don't know how drastic the cultural change was when they turned into the uh, Mycenaeans, but, you know, there was definitely a big change from the Mycenaeans into the uh, classical Greeks. Um, you know, you start have all sorts of philosophies uh, and whatnot. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and then you eventually have uh, Christianity, and um, you know, Christianity has its own evolutions as well, from kind of this like subversive slave religion. Um, you know, to help people cope under the rule of you know Rome's oppression. To uh, you know, eventually it builds up its own kind of parallel society. Parallel society becomes you know, a uh, integral part of the uh, Roman Empire, which collapses, but survives in the East. Um, and then you have, you know, all these Slavs pour in, uh, the Slavs take over in some areas, and they kind of uh, ally with the church in those areas. Like, I think the Bulgarians had their own autocephalous Orthodox Church, um, you know, but then in Greece itself, you know, you have this kind of re-Hellenization, or I guess not re-Hellenization, but Hellenization, of all these uh, Slavic invaders, um, you know, to get them to like speak Creek and, uh, you know, become proper uh, Creek Orthodox <laughs> Christians and integrate yeah. them into this uh, power structure and integrate them in a way that was very much, uh, you know, Greek Hellenic Orthodox dominated. Like there wasn't an equal relationship um, by any means as it had been in other places. Um, That's why I think, um, I know that there's that theory that they say that, um, Russian civilization or Moscow is like the third Rome and that comes from the sort of the Hellenization of orthodoxy and so forth. I mean, but, but the, the Russians, they had orthodoxy a bit later, did they not the Rus or that was, yeah. Yeah. They didn't convert to Christianity until the, uh, I think it was the eighth or the ninth. I mean, they had Christians pretty early on. Yeah. But I mean, baptism of Rus was 780 or maybe 88. I think it was 880. Baptism of Rus. I believe it was 880. Oh, sorry, 988. That was a way off. It was the 10th century. Oh, wow. But but that's but that is fascinating though, how the Slav the Slavic people that were conquering these areas, they later became Hellenized. Um and and I guess like that so I, I guess to lead up to it is that this is forming the sort of a major part of what we would know nowadays as like "Quote unquote European civilization, right? Yeah, the um, I mean Christianity very much made kind of what we view as the um, you know Western civilization today. Mm -hmm. um, you know, like the Romans and the Greeks, you know, the Carthaginians, kind of the post Bronze Age collapse peoples in the Mediterranean. You know, very much did have their own kind of like." You know, we call it Greco-Roman, but, yeah. you know, I think that really understates, I mean, Christianity, for instance, was, you know, a, uh, came out of the Semitic world, um, you know, and obviously had a huge influence and you had, you know, like, uh, Isis, the goddess, you know, she was really big, um, you know, so the Egyptians had a big influence, um, you know, so you had like all these different, there's very much this like Mediterranean civilization that we call Greco Roman, that kind of like overstate. Yeah, I guess it doesn't really overstate because they were hugely influential with the Greek philosophers, Roman power, all that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, you know, and it was very much like involved with, uh, you know, like you had Buddhists that were involved too. They don't leave records, but there's like Buddhist artifacts in Rome. Um, you know, you had like the Zoroastrians, the, you know, dualist faiths. They all had their influences and were part of this kind of like Mediterranean centered civilization that, you know, stretched all the way into India, mm -hmm. um, you know, as well as deep into uh, Northern Europe. And, you know, we do uh, kind of Western civilization does have influence from them and the extent that it survived Christianity, but, you know, that civilization very much died, you know, it's, 
like heritage was not just taken up by Western civilization, but also Islam Islamic civilization as well. Um, you know, and even to an extent like Ethiopian civilization. Um, like, you know, the uh, kind of fall of Rome, you know, you have the crisis of the third century, which saw this massive population decline, um, you know, even though the empire survived, uh, you know, you have these mass die-offs. Um, because what was happening in the Roman Empire was you actually have the uh, more economically advanced, uh, culturally sophisticated uh, peoples of the East were actually moving in large numbers to the West, you know, settling in, a, you know, England, Spain, the Balkans, Italy, um, you know, changing the genetic makeup of those countries as well. Um, you know, if Rome had, if this Mediterranean civilization had survived, you know, it would have been much more, uh, you know, kind of Middle Eastern um, genetically today than uh, we are now. Yeah, and with the... Uh, yeah, the Islamic civilization is also another interesting factor. I mean, really kicking off with the Ottoman Turks, but that... But yeah, so yeah, go ahead. I, yeah, yeah. So they expand, I guess, upwards more um, in into places like, well, nowadays, England and so forth. I mean, they're, even the English people nowadays, I think they still retain a lot of uh, Romanesque features, the nose in particular. Um, I don't think so at all. I mean, they... No. Um... What happened from the you know, the genetic studies show is that with the fall of Rome in the fifth century is that basically all the diverse urban societies died. Mm -hmm. You know, they're you know, like Mary Beard, for instance, likes to talk about Africans in uh, <laughs> you know England, and she's right. There really were Africans in uh, England, and there were you know, probably in France, and there certainly were in the Balkans. The thing is, they all died. Like none of them contribute any ancestry to you know modern peoples today or if they do you know it's such and it's in such minute amounts that it cannot be detected um i mean i think there's like one particular family in like northern england that might have some ancestry you know their y chromosome is very typically african um but autosomally they don't show any african ancestry so you know the numbers of these kind of diverse migrants that survived uh you know in spain and france and the balkans and england um, you know, and much of Italy were very, very minute. Instead, it was kind of these rural uh, peoples, uh, you know, like the Celts and uh, yeah. Yeah. You know, kind of the periphery of Britain. You have the Albanians and the Balkans. Um, you know, you have these kind of rural, uh, you know, much more Indo-European and ancestry uh, Italian farmers in uh, you know, Italy. Um, you know, those groups kind of like they have this revival in a lot of ways, um, you know, where the peoples of the uh, kind of dark ages and the early and the uh, early middle ages, but they have very, very little of that um, uh, Levantine Af in, Af in the African uh, ancestry that was very common in uh, the Roman Empire. You, you know, and part of that, too, is you have these hordes of Germans and Slavs who, you know, were like 70 percent Indo-European each as or like, you know, as they're pouring into a the empire and you know intermarrying with people yeah um i don't think their ancestry you know they didn't contribute too much ancestry outside of like britain um the germans that is you know but they definitely kind of gave the leg up to these uh rural farming societies as they wiped out the uh urban and slave areas they literally um, crushed the urbanite then <laughs> yeah yeah they, yeah they, they ended the urbanite um you know, and there's definitely records like, you know, the sack of Rome and yeah. siege of Ravenna and the, uh, you know, Italian, you know, Justinian's Italian war, um, you know, just horrible, horrible die offs that, you know, very few people survived. Um, you know, and the people that did survive were these kind of remnant populations that. Uh... Now, what happened, too, was with, uh, you know, so Christianity started to you, know, you still have popes from like West Africa. They kept in contact with the bishoprics. Uh, you know, Christianity, you know, the Byzantine Empire were very much on their way to restoring yeah. the kind of Mediterranean world into the uh, sixth and seventh centuries. Um, you know, until you have, uh, you know, the Prophet Muhammad who goes and uh, unifies the Arabs and goes on this uh, great, um, you know, series of conquests. Now, Muhammad finally. Um, he kind of ends this Mediterranean civilization once and for all, you know, 
uh, his yeah. successors, you know, they go and they overrun the Middle East. Um, you know, they end uh, Persian civilization in a lot of ways as well. You know, they extinguish Zoroastrianism. You know, they drive into Central Asia. Um, you know, and culturally extinguish the civilizations there to an extent. I mean, that's a different story, I guess, because those societies would have a huge influence on uh, Islam. Um, yeah, I wanted so, to ask you about Persian civilization later, but but, but continue on this because I, I find this fascinating. Also, I think maybe we could comment on the the sort of the influence of the more Nordic peoples as well in this time period. But but so, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Uh, sure. So you know they drive across Egypt, North Africa, and Spain, and um, you know so kind of the influence of Christianity, the Christian hierarchy. Um, you know, suddenly collapses. It suddenly becomes a lot more parochial and it becomes heavily integrated. You know, rather than being very spread out, uh, very, in, you know, independent of, um, you know, secular power, you know, because it was very much like a dual power type of situation. You had the yes. secular, uh, you know, largely German originating uh, warlords. And then at the same time, you also had the church that was collecting its tithes, controlled a lot of land. And, uh, you know, they, they could have cooperative relationships, they could have adversarial relationships, um, you know, but they were both there. And that, um, and a conflict and interaction would last for hundreds and hundreds of years. So we're talking about kind of where Western civilization came from and the end of the Mediterranean civilization. Um, yeah, and you, this is uh, the Islamic period now, so, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so the Muslims, you know, they go, they overrun a lot, you know, they're threatening Italy, um, you know, they're like taking over Sicily, the Pope's worried. So, uh, you know, Christianity is gone from being, you know, in many ways, the superior partner, you know, in the sense that it had a lot of adherence, um, you know, had a great deal of, um, you know, wealth, you know, it could command... You know, could very much overthrow a lot of these uh, kind of warlords if it wanted to. Oh yeah. You know, it successfully defeated uh, tons of heterodoxies. Um, you know, it's a very very successful, uh, you know, kind of social, political, uh, spiritual, economic model. Um, in a lot of ways, you know, just with kind of the organization they had. Um, so you know, went from that to all of a sudden it was the lesser partner. You know, it tried to. Uh, you know, just couldn't command large numbers of soldiers. Um, mm. You know, it's certainly something Islam has an advantage in theologically, where, uh, you know, Jesus is, you know, kind of, I don't want to call him an agitator, but, you know, very much a subversive in a, uh, you know, oppressive society, trying to get people to go through, right. you know, live a good life, um, you know, in a society they'll never have control of. You know, so now Christianity has to deal with how do you run a country? You know, how do you... Uh, <laughs> You know, you can't separate everything. Um, you know, there's some problems you have to take uh, head on. It doesn't have the inherent so, governing structure that Islam does, or at least at this period, yeah. Yeah. You know, Muhammad was an incredibly intelligent um, man. You know, he was mm -hmm. a merchant. You know, he'd been all over the uh, Middle East, probably read wildly uh, or wi widely, uh, you know, had contact with a lot of other, um, you know, religions. So, you know, he built kind of a total society with Islam, and yes. theologically, it's a lot simpler than uh, in a Christianity, which makes it easier to spread as well. You know, there's stuff like Christianity as the Trinity, for instance. Yes. Um, you know, Islam is very much a, you know, kind of purified monotheism. That's why um, a lot of know, perennialists there's... went to Islam, like even Rene Gunyan, like it seems that Islam from its various influences, like the ultimate perennialist religion in a lot of ways. Uh, yeah. yeah, very, very much so. Um, you know, and I think that was a lot of the, uh, the appeal to why it with all the complicated theology when, you know, Islam lays out a very, you know, strict, uh, regimented life, you, you know, and I'm stereotyping. I know there's a lot more to it than yeah, that. You know, you're saying the social technology. Yeah. Yeah. The social technology of Islam, you're looking at it from that perspective of, sort of gaining traction with diverse peoples as a civilization. That's, I think, what you're... Yeah, yeah. I know social technology, you know, that's like a a meme word that, you know... But it's true, yeah, yeah. Oh, it's a, it's a useful one, yeah. yeah. Um, you know, and 
I mean, I hate to be, you know, I know I'm very water centric for obvious reasons. <laughs> you know, Christianity, you know, is very much like a water religion. I mean, yes. You know, yes. a bunch of his disciples were fishermen. You know, he walks on water, you know, talks about fish all the time. You know, whereas Islam is very much a land religion. Um, you know, Christianity, it spread pretty quickly through, you know, like port cities. Uh, yeah. You know, you had, you know, they would set, uh, found new missions and everything. Uh, Islam, on the other hand, you know, did have a, a naval tradition from very early on. You know, you had like the pirates based out of Crete and Sicily, um, you know, that kind of thing. But it was always, uh, you know, very strongly a land religion, too. You had to yeah. integrate all these peoples who, um, you know, like Muhammad, he did caravan routes, for instance. Um, you know, the kind of organization it takes to run a caravan is very different from the kind of organization it takes to run a sea trade route. You know, there's not, you don't need like, um, you know, like for sea, you need a lot of engineers. Yeah. Uh, you know, you need a lot of kind of like quality, trust, um, you know, mathematical knowledge, that kind of thing. Uh, you know, for land trade, on the other hand, you need to focus a lot more on animal breeding, animal keeping. Uh, relationships with, uh, you know, various animal breeders on your way. Um, you know, both, of course, have to worry about bandits or pirates. Um, you know, but I do think, like, structurally, from the very beginning, the uh, institutions were, you know, different in that way. And, you know, it's something I need to do a lot more reading on, but that's kind of like my suspicion for a lot of the uh, differences between Christianity and Islam. Oh, definitely. Uh, so going back, though. Yeah, yeah. Oh, oh so, you know, by after the conquest of Spain uh, by the Muslims, uh, you have kind of like two main Christian powers left. You have the Franks in France and uh, mm -hmm. Western Germany, and you have the uh, you know Byzantine Empire, the Eastern Roman Empire, you know, in Greece and in uh, Anatolia. Um, this is where like Western civilization really gets started in the sense that you have the Pope crown Charlemagne. You know, he's still saying, yes, I have the um, power in this world as well, but, you know, you'll be my sword and my shield against, mm -hmm. you know, Christianity's enemies. Uh, you know, so Charlemagne, of course, hugely influential figure. He, uh, you know, crushes the German pagans, um, you know, in Saxony. You know, it's like the blood mass of Verdun or whatever it was called. Um, you know, he starts the Reconquista in Spain. Um you know, and his uh, government structure, you know, is very integrated with the Catholic Church. I mean, I mean, I guess it was just the Christian Church back then, since the Orthodox and the, you know, the Pope wasn't really the supreme. You know, I don't think he proclaimed himself like the supreme leader of Christianity by that point. He was no, still uh, equal no. to the other, uh, you know, patriarchs. Um, so, you know, you very much have, like, the expansion of the Frankish state, you know, as an expansion of the Christian religion as well. And because it was such a powerful and wealthy state, you start to have, like, the, uh, rede you know, rediscovery of learning, which, you know, I know it had survived in places like Ireland and everything. Um, you know, but Charlemagne, you know, he goes and spreads that as well. Yeah. Um, you know, he goes and does, like... Uh, so a lot of the peoples weren't necessarily under his control, you know, but fall under the Christian religion, um, you know, for whatever reason. But they go and they, you know, like trade, learning, all that stuff, you know, it's commonly taught as, you know, something that, you know, it's apolitical, it doesn't have yeah. anything to do with religion. And that's not actually true at all. Um, you know, all of these... Uh, you know, like material technologies have a very real basis in social technology. A they lot of it much through educational with, institutions. Yeah, and the evangelizing of faith as well. I mean, a lot of the knowledge preservation in general, a lot of even the technical knowledge was prob was a product of the various uh, scholars and monks within um, the Catholic Church and so forth. I mean, that's, uh, yeah. Yes, exactly. 100% true. So you have this, um, you know, and everyone just looks up for the prestige culture too. So you have the people with the most wealth or the most valuable trade partners or the most sophisticated culture. Um, you know, there's very much a draw factor to Christianity. And with mm -hmm. Christianity comes the integration with Christian institutions. 
institutions. And, um, you know, there's kind of like a complicated relationship where, you know, when, uh, and they're proclaimed the Holy Roman em emperors, the, uh, you know, kind of Franks and their successors in the Holy Roman Empire. You know, as an emperor, they're believing that they're the supreme um, emperor authority on earth. You know, and they yeah. kind of have a rival with the Pope, who's also claiming, um, you know, that position. And there's the whole investiture controversy in the 11th century. You know, they have the Crusades and everything, you know, where the Pope's literally summoning up armies. Um, you know, so there's that kind of conflict between yeah. church and state, which, uh, you know, drags on until the last couple hundred years. Um, you know, but that's the real birth of Western civilization. You have this, uh, kind of expansion out of the, uh, kind of Frankish realm, um, you know, and its institutions, even if they're not, you know, like Poland, for instance, remained separate of the political institutions of the Holy Roman Empire but was integrated into the relig religious institutions of the Christian church. Um, you know, and there's similar stuff in uh, England, Spain, all of that. So, uh, you know, Christianity ended up being mu much more successful than the, uh, you know, political Holy Roman Empire. Um, and Christianity also had the genetic aspect in that since the Islamic world was not, you know, was explicitly excluded from a lot of this stuff. Right. Um, you know, people would not intermarry across religious lines. It was viewed as kind of like the ultimate no-no. Um, you know, you had like this kind of, you know, in the Roman era where you had a lot of uh, mixing, you know, like Germans and Anatolia, Levantine people in England, you know, there wasn't any of that really in, um, in the Middle Ages or the early modern era. You know, yeah. that's... So you have this uh, kind of like Indo-European culture or a genetic cluster, you know, that had formed in the uh, third millennium BC that made this, uh, you know, had been in decline in the Roman period from large scale immigration from the Middle East. Um, but it was revived by the die offs in the Dark Ages and uh, kind of the repopulation of Europe by these rural peoples, as well as the Germans and the Slavs. So you have this, um, you know, the white race, even though it's far older than Western civilization, is revitalized alongside of Western civilization. Mm. So it predates it, but it also accompanies it, if that makes any sense. Oh, that it makes tons of sense. I mean, uh, the revitalization of, of, I guess, white European civilization, how Christianity provided uh, an ideological or social technology that ensured the sort of preservation of these various peoples. Um, very fascinating. I, I know it contradicts a lot of, um, the sort of, uh, I guess, modern, like right wing pagan interpretation of Christianity, destroying civil Western civilization. But, um, and I, 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 in some parts, I of course sympathize with some of that. Uh, but you know, as a Christian, of course, you know, I like, I like your interpretation better. Um, but, but so where does the, then the Northern sort of European element, the sort of the Nordic or Nordicist element come from, like, where do they factor in this equation then? I mean, that's the Franks. The Franks were originally right. uh, Germanic people. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, so then, so then you have this sort of the, the rise of Christendom, the rise of what we know now as pro European civilization proper. Um, and then uh, I, I know that you've extensively covered um, the, the, uh, I guess what you you would say the the Caucasus, the Eurasian civilization, the Slavs, um, then the Golden Horde comes through and so forth. Um, so oh, what what else was I going to ask you about? So then yeah, so then uh, the the repelling of the Isla the Islamic element. Uh, now I now I remember my point. Now I remember my point. Um, when you like like sort of the mainstream historians like Mary Beard that talk about how there was diversity and uh, it was sort of like I guess. Uh, we're Canadian model, what they think of a diversity and multiculturalism. But I guess the thesis, what you're saying is that these elements of people mixing into places like England, that that was a brief period, but it can only be a result. And, and this goes to your talk you had with um, Patrick Casey on the Roman civilization. It could only happen at the higher end of civilization. And as soon as those civilizations collapsed, the sort of, I guess you would say, proto multicultural experiences 
they sort of go by the wayside. These people experience a die off or, and so forth. Uh, is, is that more or less correct? Yes. I mean, a lot of qualifier that there was still a lot of multiculturalism in the middle ages. Yeah. Um, you know, in the Mediterranean in particular, however, a lot of it was restricted to these urban areas that were basically population sinks. There were all sorts of diseases that people would get. Uh, real estate prices were high. So marriage, um, ages were very high. Um, so those people had lower growth rates and, uh, you know, were constantly dying off and be re being replenished by people from the countryside. So even though there was a lot of diversity in the uh, middle ages as well, um, at least in the Mediterranean, it didn't leave much of a uh, genetic impact. Yeah, yeah. And of course, nowadays, uh, modern, <laughs> modern politicized historians have to exaggerate the, uh, the impact that they had on culture and so forth. Um, but uh, let's, let's sort of uh, talk about um, another... Oh, there's so many things to talk about with you, Peter. Uh, but I, I think um, let's, let's go to, I guess, in current times... Um, specifically with the sort of Slavic or Eurasianism, um, I wanted to, I want to get your take on the sort of uh, the developments that are happening right now in, uh, in the blue and yellow country, but, uh, the claim of Eurasian civilization being unique from the West, um, what is your opinion? I, uh, I know you have a very nuanced take on the sort of Russian or Eurasian experience, but what is your take of, in terms of the claim of like Eurasianism stands in between two mega civilizations, that they are the unique people and that they're sort of a unique conglomeration of these different peoples, whether it be, you know, the, from the Caucasus to the Tartars and so forth. Um, I, I know people like Alexander Dugan, for instance, uh, talk about, um, how, you know, Eurasianism and the current conflict, how there's a coming home of Eurasian peoples. Uh, but so, so what do you take to be in, in like, are they a unique civilization? They're very integrated, of course, in, in Europe proper, but it seems that nowadays there's more of an emphasis, especially in Western Europe, to sort of feed into that claim that the Eurasian people, they're wholly unique people, and they have a totally different civilization and ethnogenesis. So, especially, you know, sparked by recent events. So, uh, w but what is your take on the whole Eurasianism thing proper? I don't buy it personally. Really? Um, really? Yeah, it's, uh, I don't know, there's a guy called Gumul Yaf, who I've always really hated. He was always trying to find evidence that, uh, was in Kazas and, you know, all those peoples were, uh, the same people. Um, you know, they have more in common with each other than they did with Europeans. Um, I, mean, I think there's the argument it could be made for several extinct uh, Slavic groups like the Cossacks, mm -hmm. uh, who really did mix in with a lot of those people, uh, both in Central Asia, Siberia, and the Caucasus. I know one of the famous uh, white warlords of the Civil War period, um, uh, Ataman Semyonov, uh, he was actually a quarter Buryat. Uh, you know, Buryats are kind of a Siberian Mongol group in ancestry. He could speak like fluent Buryats, had tons of Buryat soldiers and everything. Um, if those guys had survived into the present, I could see it being a more convincing case. Mm -hmm. um, you know, what happened was they're basically exterminated by the uh, Bolsheviks 100 years ago. Um, so that kind of genuine Eurasian uh, synthesis has been extinguished. Um, I think you could, if, for the Russians too, I mean, like a lot of their, it is true, for instance, that you have, uh, you know, rather than becoming Catholic and integrated with the uh, Western world and you know, kind of the institutions that, you know, grew, grew out of what the uh, Franks and the uh, Christians uh, kind of came to an agreement with in the uh, 8th and ninth centuries. Um, you know, Rome was different in the sense that, you know, they wanted to be integrated. You know, you have the Black Sea trade route, you know, with Constantinople. You know, they would bring amber from the Baltic. They would bring uh, furs from... Um, you know, kind of like Udmortia and the uh, Komi lands mm -hmm. of the far north. You know, they'd ship them down the uh, river, um, send them into the Black Sea, sell them in Constantinople, you know, and then return, like import, um, you know, all sorts of stuff that the uh, Byzantines had access to. Um, so they wanted to be very much be part of that kind of Byzantine world, have access to, uh, you know, the remnants of that Mediterranean civilization. Um, they're always very far away from it. 
you know, they actually got cut away from it a couple times. Uh, most, you know, you have the Kumans, aka the Palatsi, the field people. Uh, you know, another Turkic-speaking nomadic horde. You have the Tatars, the Mongols. Um, you know, all those groups that kind of separated them from that, uh, you know, naval destiny in the uh, Black Sea and the Aegean. Yeah. Um, you know, they tried to reach it uh, a couple times. They finally conquer, conquered, uh, you know, reached um, the Sea of Azov in the, uh, you know, eighteenth early 18th century under Peter the Great and finally uh, solidified their con uh, control over it under Catherine the Great. Um, you know, by that point, the world was so oriented towards the West, and they already had, you know, Peter the Great brought over his Dutchman. Catherine the Great was a German yes. herself. Um, you know, like, even for hundreds of years, you'd had, um, like, Englishmen, Dutchmen, Germans, Italians, a huge influence in architecture and oh, in really? Uh, really? artillery know. manufacturing in the uh, 15th and 16th centuries. Um, it was very much integrated with the Western world, even if it kept that kind of orthodox, you know, Greek legacy Mediterranean cultural technology. Yeah. And it was very much separated from that world. Um, the other thing, too, was that, you know, yes, like something like a third of the noble families of Russia were of Tatar origin. Um, you know, they had a very, you know, that. Russia was an agricultural state. You know, they had served them. Yes. They forced people to stay on the land. And, I mean, they had to. That was... Um, societies that didn't do that were quickly overrun. Like, you know, no one's ever heard of the Mordvins, for instance. They're mm -hmm. like... There's like a million of them. Um, you know, they're still alive. They're people. Um, you know, they had agriculture, but they were very tribal. Um you know, they had kind of like the uh, the chieftain would call up his warriors and, you know, they'd go fight when they were asked, but they'd always like feud with the Lord. They wouldn't necessarily give him all the money he needed. You know, and as a result, the Mordvins were always like the plaything. They were always easily overrun by, you know, one kingdom or another. Mm. Uh, so for the Russians, it was different. Um, you know, some of them did do that. But, you know, in Moscow, you have this kind of long period where, you know, the Black Death conveniently killed off a bunch of the... Uh, um, claimants to the thrones. They had this really long period of like you know, 200 years where they had something like one single civil war. Hmm. Um, so rather than you know feuding with uh, all of their uh, you know brothers and cousins and whatnot, they're actually able to consolidate a lot of land under their direct control. Um, you know, and build kind of this uh, modern rather than feudal state. And uh, what that enabled them to do was, since they had direct ownership over all of these people who were in serfed, um, you know, they would force them to go and kind of labor. You know, they'd build fortifications on the frontier. They actually had this, uh, you know, giant wooden wall, you know, kind of like the Great Wall of Russia in a way, <laughs> which was made of uh, wood rather than stone. Um, you know, and the goal was to keep these kind of rampaging uh, steppe nomads from uh, kind of raiding into the territory of Russia. And they kept on expanding it and expanding it. And, you know, the contract, and it wasn't really a contract, like the people really were oppressed, um, you know, very tightly managed. Uh, you know, they had to do whatever, you know, they basically had no rights or anything, you know, which is very, very different from Western Europe, where Western Europe, like peasant leagues and, uh, you know, um, kind of a middle class were very common. You know, there were towns yeah, everywhere. What the juvenile would call the ancient regime, like their experience of feudalism, there was much more ability for the peasants and the feudal serfs to have like sort of a say in their own governance in Western Europe than, than in Russia. Uh, my former co-host, uh, well, he wasn't even a co-host, um, he, uh, Lev, he uh, would go to great lengths expressing how terrible it was to be a Russian serf. And it was true, though. That it was pretty terrible. So, yeah. 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 You know, there wasn't really an alternative. The alternatives were, you know, you could run away to the north, which some people did, and mm -hmm. uh, mix in with the uh, relic tribes there. And, you know, interestingly, some were actually very successful. And uh, it's not a coincidence, that area that was kind of outside of, um, you know, it's more like, you know, because all 
in evil in early modern states, they weren't absolute states. There wasn't, right. you know, equality before the law or anything. They were very particularistic. Like every town, every region, you know, every lord had his own contract with uh, the sovereign. You know, and there were all sorts, you know, sometimes the lord would own like multiple different territories. Each one would have like a different relationship, uh, you know, to the leader. Yeah, um, absolutism was a much, much later development. Yeah. 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 Uh, you know, the nice thing was, by all the relatives of the, uh, you know, Grand Duke of Moscow dying off, he was able to take over personal administration for a lot of his lands and, uh, you know, have, like, very much absolute rule in those places that he directly owned. Hmm. Um, you know, kind of set up, like, a new system of primogeniture, um, which it wasn't really, like, formalized until much you know, until I think the end of the uh, 18th or early 19th century, I think it might have been 1825, yeah. actually, the primogeniture was, like, officially, um, you know, made the law, um, you know, just with Russia's modernization. You know, but before that, they'd just kind of gotten lucky with, um, you know, palace coups and whatnot, not turning into uh, civil wars. Um, where was I going with this? Oh, yeah. So you have... Uh, so, you know, the people who run away to the far north, yeah, it was really barren, but, you know, they had, uh, you know, more, I don't want to say equal, but, you know, they had a middle class up there that was very mercantile. They'd get the, uh, you know, furs, they trade with people, yeah. you know, they'd pay their taxes, um, you know, and in return, the, uh, you know, the Grand Duke or later the Tsar would go and protect them. Um, you know, that was not true in the more fertile agricultural areas of kind of Russia proper. Um, you know, where he, everyone, like, dressed him, you know, where they were his slave. Um, as they were, pretty much. Yeah, yeah. They had no rights and they had no alternatives. Their alternatives were they could run away to, uh, you know, the steppe, which was depopulated, but they'd most likely be, you know, raped, <laughs> enslaved, whatever, by these uh, hordes of savage nomads that were everywhere, um, you know, who would, like, you know, very, very cruel life. Um, and some did, like some did successfully, you know, kind of like uh, our ancestors in America, a bunch of them, um, their uh, treacherous relatives would like run away and join the Indians. So <laughs> I like the Cherokee or like, absurd, you know, you're seeing like all these Cherokee with blonde hair and blue eyes. And, you know, it's because they basically took over the, there were so many renegades that ran away and joined the Cherokee that they bas basically turned them white. Um, and there was similar stuff with like the Tatars, for instance. Where the Tatars barely have any of the kind of original uh, Turkic ancestry, just because they kept on accepting uh, all these runaways, um, you know. But the population density in the step societies was just very, very low because so much of the land was uh, allocated to cattle grazing rather than uh, agricultural cultivation. Um, so it's kind of like a ecological mode of production kind of conflict between yeah. the uh, her herdsmen and the uh, farmers. And, you know, that's a massive over oversimplification. Of course, you know, the Russians had their own uh, pastoral areas. Of course, the Tatars had their, uh, you know, agriculture. Um, you know, that's just kind of a rough simplification. Um, so, yeah, yeah. So, you, uh, I, so you're saying that the sort of modern interpretation of Eurasianism that comes from even thinkers like Shotsunitsyn, um, so, I mean, Alexander Dugan is like the pop example. Um, you're saying that that's really just a fiction that comes much later. That um, the whole like come like the the Eurasian people coming into being that that's sort of like more of a political fiction than rather than an actual genetic reality among these various you know Caucasus, Russo, uh, Slavic peoples, Tartars. That that's really. Um, a misnomer, if you will. Is that what you're saying? Um, For modern Russians today, specifically, yes. If, um, you know, like Cossack nationalists don't exist anymore because they were mm. pretty much extinguished 100 years ago by the Bolsheviks. But, you know, if they had become an independent state, like they were trying to set up in the uh, Russian Civil War, um, you know, I think Eurasianism would be like an accurate description for their history, but not for the Russians.